As we feed our body with its daily nourishment, let us not forget that more importantly, we must feed our souls with the Word of God, the food for our souls. Be a part of spreading the good news and nourishing others. Subscribe, like, share, and tap the notification bell in order to be updated every time we have a new reflection for you. Come, let us partake of the food for our souls. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that had been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them to us, I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom. In the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue, synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today the scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning, Father. My dear brothers and sisters, we are in the third Sunday in ordinary time, and our Gospel this Sunday is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke. And if you notice, our Gospel this Sunday, the very first part of it is the very beginning also of the Gospel of St. Luke. And you know, the first four verses of his Gospel makes him really different from all the other synoptic Gospels. Let's just review that. Remember, we have how many Gospels? We have four Gospels. And out of the four, three, we consider them to be, we call them as the synoptic Gospels. We call them synoptic Gospels because the word synoptic comes from two words, syn, S-Y-N, and optic. Syn means same, similar, optic optical view that's why when we say synoptic they have the same view in short in simple words it means they tell similar stories three of the gospels if you compare them their stories are almost similar there will be slight differences but almost the same as i said the word is similar and what are these three gospels that we consider to be synoptic we have matthew mark and look that's why if you compare the gospel of saint john compared to the three gospels saint john is very theological it's very different from all the other three gospels that's why we call them as again synoptic gospels and as i have said the very beginning of the gospel of saint luke makes him different from the other two synoptics that means matthew and mark why because it is only luke the gospel of luke that gives a kind of a prologue or perhaps the simpler term is a kind of an introduction if you go to the gospel of matthew and mark it automatically goes into the story but the gospel of saint luke gives a certain introduction and that is very characteristic of greek writers that's why you know the greek writers every time they begin to write something they would always make a little introduction introduces what he is doing, what's the purpose of his work. 
that gives us an idea that Luke is not really Jewish from the very beginning. That gives us an idea that Luke is Greek and he is a convert, okay? That's why, that's how he writes. And aside from that, remember, St. Luke gives us the reason why he wants to write his own version. He says that since many have undertaken to complete a narrative of the events that have fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed down to us, listen to what he says. I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write down in an orderly sequence. That's why if you compare Mark and Matthew with Luke, you will notice that the Gospel of St. Luke is very orderly in the presentation of the events. He tries his best to make it very chronological, orderly, in how he will, he will present Jesus Christ. And of course, he said, and he addresses it to a certain name, Theophilus. Of course, generally, we believe that he's addressing it to somebody who is in authority named Theophilus. But some Bible scholars would actually give us a suggestion of saying that the word Theophilus only represents a kind of a group of people. Because if you analyze the word Theophilus, again, it comes from two words in Latin, Theo, Theos. Remember when you were studying, when you say Theo, what does that mean? God, right? And philo means love. That's why when you put Theophilus, it actually means lover of God. Because Luke himself is not Jewish. He's not a believer. He was a convert. He is a lover of God. That's why some Bible scholars would say that Luke, because he's a convert from being a Gentile, he is a Greek. He's Greek. An educated man. He is writing to his fellow Greek who may, may at that time not believe or are considered to be Gentiles, but as a search for God, the love for God. That's why he is making an, an orderly sequence for those who are maybe not Jews, but has the love for God. He writes to anybody who is Theophilus, which is very good for us to consider. That's why. He writes in a very, very convincing way because he wants to prove the most important, another important thing that we have to take note in the introduction of, of St. Luke is this, that he writes an orderly sequence of the events in order for the Theophiluses, those who have the love of God, in order for them to believe in the stories that have been handed to them by the eyewitnesses. That means those who really saw those events. He wants to convince them that those stories are really true. And the point is, when he says that those stories are really true, conclusion, bottom line, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise in the Old Testament that there will be a Savior. That's why, as we continue, notice chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and all of a sudden, we jump to chapter 4. Did you notice that? We skip more than three chapters. All of a sudden, we are brought to chapter 4. And what is that chapter 4? It is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. When we say, of course, public ministry of Jesus, that's the time when he starts teaching to the people. And the Gospel of St. Luke, when he started, says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Because the story just before this, remember, the first part I'm explaining, that's chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and then all of a sudden, chapter 4, we are here in chapter 4. The event just before this, when he returned to Galilee, is the temptations of Christ. Remember when he, when he was tempted, he received the Holy Spirit. No wonder here, Luke tells us that when he returned to Galilee, in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. You know, Bible scholars and historians would say that it was a very practical and very wise move for Jesus to begin his public ministry in Galilee. Why is that a very wise and uh, practical move for Jesus to begin in Galilee? Well, because Galilee 
from south to north is about 50 miles, from east to west is about 25 miles. Relatively, it's a small place. But even though it's a small place, it's densely populated. Densely populated. So when you think of densely populated, therefore, Jesus automatically will have an easy audience. And aside from that, Galilee is surrounded by non-Jewish cities around. Therefore, if it is in the middle of all the non-Jewish cities, it's a mix of everything. And because it's a mix of everything, people in Galilee were open-minded and ready to accept any idea. They're very sophisticated people. That's why Galilee is a very fertile ground for the teaching of Jesus. In fact, Galilee is literally fertile compared to Judea. They say that in Galilee, stick anything on the ground, it will grow. That's why they have all kinds of plants. No wonder it's densely populated. What do you expect? Will you live in the desert? Of course, I live in the fertile land. That's why Galilee, even though it's small, because the land is very fertile, you plant anything, it grows. That's why people live in Galilee. That's why it's densely populated. That's why for Jesus to be in Galilee and begin his public ministry, boom, he immediately got to the audience. They were all up for it. And of course, the Gospel of St. Luke tells us he goes to the synagogue because the synagogue, of course, is the place for teaching. As I have told you that already before, there's only one temple and the temple is for offering sacrifices. They go to the temple only when there are special occasions, especially Passover feast, and all the Jews would go up to the temple. But on Sabbath day, everybody goes to their own respective synagogues according to the rule. If there are like 10 families, like neighbors, every 10 families will have one synagogue. That's why there will be synagogues everywhere. And the neighborhood on the Sabbath would go to their synagogue. And on Passover feast, everybody goes up to the temple. I hope you see the difference. That's why the synagogue is a place for teaching. It's a small place. It's like sharing the scriptures. That's why in the synagogue, they don't really have like official preachers or what. The neighbors on Sabbath, when they go to the synagogue, somebody is in charge there. And we'll just say, okay, you do the first reading, you do the third, second reading. <laughs> okay, their practice is to have seven readings. They'll just pinpoint who. That's why in our gospel today, Jesus was in the synagogue and he was asked to read. And when he stood up, he was given the scroll. Remember that the scriptures during that time is not like one book that we have now, the Bible. Remember that before it was compiled into one book. Remember that they are separate scrolls. It's like one scroll is one story. Okay? So when Jesus stood up, he was given the scroll, and it happened that it was from the book of Isaiah the prophet. And Jesus unrolled the scroll, the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. In short, when you summarize those phrases in the book of prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, Isaiah was prophesying that there will be a Savior. Do you follow? This is the remark, the work of the Savior. That's why for Jesus to read that, going back to the prophecy of prophet Isaiah, that there will be a savior who will do all these things. Saint Luke says, rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, you know, for official teachings. Now when father gives the homily, he stands up. But in official functions, you sit down. It's a sign of authority. That's why I noticed the Pope, the bishops, when they are making official pronouncements, they have to sit down on their throne. That's really the posture of the professor. That's why in the universities, right, we have the professor's chair. Okay, when they are like officially teaching, that's their chair. Nobody can sit there. It's an official. That's why for Jesus to sit down, everybody looked intently at him. Why? Because now he will begin to teach. 
and share from the scroll that he read. And he said, Today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I hope you get the point of the church. Why today in our gospel, the church took the first four verses and then took the fourth chapter, put them together. Why? Because what is mentioned by Luke in his introduction to prove Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, found in chapter 4. They belong together. My dear brothers and sisters, may just St. Luke who tries his best to prove to us that Jesus indeed is the fulfillment of the promise in the Old Testament that there will be a Savior. May we too believe in what he believed and in what he proclaimed. Thank you for partaking of the Word of God, the food for our souls, and being part of spreading the good news and nourishing others. May God bless and protect you.